Hello and welcome to Money Purpose Live. Money Purpose is a series of interviews with over 20 experts that have mastered tools and strategies which led them to their financial success. What wealth creators, fire experts, money coaches have done differently to have the right money mindset and create more money during COVID-19. In this series, you will gain the most relevant insights and strategies to help you pivot or thrive through current challenging times. The Money Purpose series was created by Blossom Media Studio to empower you to take control of your finances. Now let's get right into it. On today's episode, we have guest Ron Malhotra. Now Ron is an award-winning wealth planner, renowned thought leader, entrepreneur, international best-selling author, speaker, and business mentor. Ron is also the founder of The Successful Mail and the managing director of Maple Tree Wealth Management and Blackfooted Business Advisors. We're really excited to have Ron on the show. Now let's get right into it. Welcome back and thank you so much for being with us today and um, joining us on Money Purpose Series where my sole purpose is to really give you tools um, about money and what money serves so that you can figure out the strategy for yourself and choose something that is working for you. The purpose of this is really to give back um, to community to figure out what we can do better with our money as a tool in you know, during this time such as pandemic. And today we are so excited to have one and only Ron Maholtra. So, and with, with me today, actually, I have my husband, Abhinav Chan. Um, thank you, Ron, for being here. Welcome. Thank you for having yeah. me. So maybe you can walk us back a little bit your, of your background and how you became a financial coach. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, so just to give you some background, I was born in India, which is... Um, uh, a country where there's obviously a lot of poverty and um, uh, you know my, I came from a, an average middle class background my parents never really had money uh, and then uh, when I was very young we migrated to Australia and I always had this perception that people in the western world would have more wealth now mm -hmm. Australia is actually considered one of the wealthiest countries on the planet when it comes to income and lifestyle mm -hmm. Uh, however, I started to notice that anyone, most people I knew um, were basically living paycheck to paycheck. Mm, that's right. And um, it was uh, in my late teens that I came across an article that said that 65% of the world's wealth is controlled by something like 3% of the world population. And uh, it really intrigued me. I thought I, I thought it was a typo in the newspaper, but then I started to read it. Um, I was just amazed at the wealth disparity that exists in yeah. the world. I then started to realize that, uh, you know, I was broke myself. I had no money. I used to live in a, when I moved out of home, I ended up moving into a commission house. And a commission house is effectively where if you're a delinquent, you're a convict, you're a, you have a drug problem, mm. you know, you're, you're long-term unemployed, that's where you live. So I lived with these five guys and that was the only place I could afford. And um, one day um, I came home and uh, there was a fleet of police cars parked on the street. And uh, as I was walking in, they said, is your name Ron? I said, yes. They said, we found these drugs in your room. Oh. I said, well, they're not mine. I don't, I don't deal with them. And they said, okay, they believed me because when they looked at the other guys, they looked at me, I was quite, you know, my, I didn't, I, they could tell I'm not a drug user. And they believed me, so they left. But what happened after that was for the next 20 minutes, I was brutally bashed up by those guys because they were not happy that I dropped them in. So I was kicked. I was in a fetal position trying to protect my face as they continually kicked me over and over again. And after 20 minutes, I, w I got up and I couldn't recognize my face. It was swollen. It was bloodied. Oh, wow. And I think that was the day I realized it became a catalyst for me that I never wanted to be without options again. So I became extremely obsessed with learning everything about money and wealth because I made the determination subconsciously that more money equals more choices and more options and less money equals less choices and less options. And I didn't want to be without options again. The problem though was I developed a very unhealthy relationship with money. Mm -hmm. In order to learn everything about money, I started to work at a bank and then I started to observe people's um, habits around money. And I, I started to educate myself and I was very lucky because in the corporate career, I did extremely well. And by the time I was 31, I had acquired a few million dollars worth of assets. 
and I knew everything about money. I'd mastered money to the point where you could not stump me if you asked me a money or wealth question. Uh, there's a pretty good chance that I knew what I was talking about. The problem, though, was I wasn't inspired by what I was doing. So I had literally developed an unhealthy relationship with money. And I think a lot of people either have money avoidance or they have a money obsession. Yeah. And I, I had become money obsessed at that point. But then I kind of realized I was not inspired at all. I was not happy. I was not feeling fulfilled. And then I came across Anthony Robbins' quote, which said, uh, success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure. Absolutely. And so really, my real education then started at the age of 31. I'm 42 now. And my real education started at 31, where I reinvented myself. I still was money minded. But this time I made a decision that I was going to create wealth doing what I loved and something that had meaning and something that would make a difference. I didn't just want to become another wealthy guy um, who had money, but didn't have fulfillment, didn't have purpose, didn't have cause, and was not living a life of significance. So I then that was the change. So I developed mm -hmm. a much healthier relationship with money after that. But I'm still amazed at the fact that majority of people cannot get money right. So here we are in 2020. Yeah. According to Bloomberg, there are 45 million millionaires on the entire planet. Okay, 45 million. Now, even if you say, well, there is, let's say, a few more million people that, you know, we don't have a record of where they keep their money. Let's just add another four or five million. 49 million on the entire planet out of 7.8 billion. Now, as a ratio, that is less than half a percent. Uh, yeah. Okay, I, I, it needs to sink in because this is across the world, by the way. So, in, are you from the United States? Yeah, we're in San Diego, California right now. So I'm from United India. States. She's from Russia. Just, just so you know, but she's Vietnamese. So we actually we're both immigrants in that sense. Uh, to, yeah, we, but we do live in San Diego, California now. Yes. Well, in your country, which is considered to be the most uh, advanced economy in the world, in yeah. a way, um, you have 19 million of those 49 million come from the United States alone. Okay, and then the rest come from the rest of the world. But wow. even then, if you look at it as an absolute uh, ratio of the entire global population, what? half a percent of people, less than half a percent of people become millionaires. That's it. 99.5% mm -hmm. do not ever get there. Mm -hmm. And not that a million bucks is a lot of money today, because if you look at longevity trends, you guys are expected to live well into your 90s. Right. I'm expected to live well into my 90s. So if the average person is going to stop working at the age of 60, because of right. circumstances that are out of their control, how are they going to support themselves for 25, 30, 35 years? on a system where social security I and mean, the government's are in massive debt, you can't rely on your children. So if you haven't built financial wealth, how are you going to support yourself? Absolutely. Yeah. The interesting thing is, uh, you know, I, put, I talk a lot about things like achievement and performance and productivity and influence and all of those sorts of things that empower you in life. But every time I talk about money and wealth, I get attacked, misunderstood, labeled arrogant, labeled yeah. greedy. And I just, I'm, it amazes me the amount of wealth, the negative associations people have with wealth. We feel shame in admitting that we want to be wealthy. Now, America, in, in America, it's still different. You guys are still very achievement oriented and you have less shame than other cultures. But for example, in Australia, you would be very hard pressed to find somebody who says, I want to be wealthy. Mm -hmm. You're not going to find people in India that would say, I want to be wealthy or they will, but they kind of have a bit of shame around it. So, one of the things I, I became obsessed with was to work out why is it that very few people ever get there? Is it a case of not having the right knowledge, not knowing the right strategy, or is there something else? Is it psychology? And I started to make the determination that psychology was a huge contributing factor and majority of people had been programmed to fail financially as a guaranteed fact. Let me explain it to you further. Majority of the human race has mastered survival. Mm. Meaning we know how to make just enough money to pay the bills, put food on the table. Some people have been able to master success, meaning they know how to make enough money to have the basics, but also have some luxuries. Right. But majority of people have certainly not mastered the ability to keep money and multiply wealth. They know how to make money, which is very different skill set to keeping money and multiplying wealth. Absolutely. Okay, they're very different skill sets. What makes you money is not what's going to teach you how to keep it and multiply it. The mindset is different and the skill set is different to, to be able to do that. Right. Okay. So majority of people don't even have the awareness. And if you actually look at where people sit, 
on the on financial scales to make it very simple majority of people are in financial scarcity across the world some in financial survival some in financial stability some in financial security a few in financial confidence and very few in financial abundance there are levels mm. right now what i don't understand is this why is it that majority of people who are sitting in scarcity and survival why is it that they hate money there is a intense hatred towards wealthy people so much so that if you actually look in the movie industry whether you look at hollywood or you look at bollywood you will find in majority of the movies the bad guy is has is either wealthy or is driven by wealth the good guy is typically financially irresponsible and how we have been conditioned right from the beginning is to attach honor to the guy who's struggling and feel shame and embarrassment and we have this eek factor around becoming wealthy right so yeah. this is how we've been conditioned right from the beginning and that's why you know anyone that propagates a message of financial responsibility is always met with resistance and people will jump in and say but you don't know my situation ron it's so hard I, and i tell them you don't know my situation dude i've been on both sides i know what it's like to be poor and i know like what it's like to be financially secure and you need to be at least open minded to hearing another perspective which a lot of people aren't unfortunately so unfortunately i believe a lot of people are perpetuating their own financial struggle mm. simply because they are not open and receptive about learning how to create wealth not about how to create money any everyone knows how to make money that's easy how to create wealth and the other thing i realized was that a lot of people psychologically place value on making money simply because it affords the necessities so if you value making money it's not the same as valuing wealth creation mm. it's a very different thing everybody values making money because everybody needs money but very few people actually value the art and science of wealth creation the whole the mindset is completely different and the value system is completely different and really if it comes down to it i would say there are three types of people in the world one who make money because they need it second ones who make money because they want to spend it on luxuries and the third who actually want to make money to create wealth only the third category actually become wealthy because mm. psychologically they prioritize wealth creation they always find time and resources for it whereas the other two categories if they're making money they don't actually want the money they want something else that they can exchange the money for right they want the trips they want the house they want the you know whatever it is that they want they want the money so that they can give it up and get something else in return whereas the wealthy people want to make money because they like to see their wealth grow right right and so there is a so there is a very different way of thinking which the average person simply doesn't understand and the other problem is a lot of people make just assumptions that Well, if I just invest in some stocks in real estate, I'll become wealthy. Oh no, not at all. If that was so easy, then we would have done it by now, right? We all now, would have. We all have done it already. That's right. And Instagram doesn't help when you get all these young kids. Every single person now, you know, can claim to know about wealth and to teach people how to make money and all of this sort of stuff. And it's incomplete information. It's biased information, mm. and it Sound doesn't bites. take. It's just exactly right, and it's not helpful. But what it's doing is it's creating an illusion of knowledge. Right. You get all these young kids that are watching it and going, "Well, you know what? I know I'll just be I'll be fine because I'll just do this real estate investing, like I heard on Instagram." But there is so much that they don't know about how to get started, and honestly, nobody should invest until they have the ability to influence their income first. Mm. Okay. Oh, I agree so, with you. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. And thank you so much for sharing. And I'm just amazed with the. You know the deep knowledge that you are sharing, and that going back to the history too, because a lot of audience that gonna be watching this um, recording that we are targeting to, it's millennials who are like us, you know, late twenties, um, trying to figure out, you know, making more money, and a lot of kids who are Generation Z who just graduating and trying to figure out their life. And I believe that what you have just shared should be engraved in the like future education because they've taught their whole life by their parents that well just go to school get a degree and then you know work till 65 make sure you invest in your retirement account and that's the 
basic if they have been taught, then yeah, they will off. Point, though, because I, if you actually look at the origins of the education system, the academic education system, which I think was uh, derived from the Westminster system of education, yeah. and I think it was the education system was never designed to produce capitalists. It was always designed to produce laborers for capitalists. Okay. Right. So the employee mindset, there's nothing wrong in being an employee, but there is everything wrong with an employee mindset. Mm -hmm. So even if you want to become, if you, if your goal is to remain within a corporation and work up the corporate ladder, you need to still have an entrepreneurial mindset. Right. Employee mindset is at the greatest risk now. And all the pandemic has done, it's exposed everyone who is unprepared and unskilled and has the wrong mindset. Absolutely. Now, we have to understand pandemics or any type of crisis, it doesn't destroy people. It exposes people. Mm. These crises only expose people. All they do is expose the lack of preparation, the lack of planning, because anybody who expects that the global economy is never going to go through a bust phase, it's right. always going to continue to boom and has no contingency plan to ride out these times, is the person who is basically getting into the ocean without a life vest. Yeah. And so when the tides come in, what's going to happen is a lot of these people are going to drown and sink because they were not prepared. They're going to blame the wave, but really they need to take responsibility for the fact that they should have never got into the water without being prepared. And when we talk about getting into the water, the context that I'm talking about is everyone that has an income is paying taxes and has expenses is in the money game, whether they like it or not. Yeah. But in the game of money, the problem is majority of people don't understand the rules of the game and they don't know how to read the scoreboard. Can you imagine getting into any sport, not knowing the rules, not being able to read the scoreboard and expecting to win? It is impossible. In fact, it's a mathematical certainty that majority of professionals will fail financially. It's a mathematical certainty. Yeah. They do not have the mindset for wealth. They do not have the skill set for wealth. And this is how the system has been created to create workers who will support governments, who will support universities, who will support the banking system and corporations but are not going to be able to create financial wealth for their own families simply because they're uneducated. And the moment you give them an ed option for ed being educated, they attack the source of the education. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it, it's, it's remarkable. I mean, I've been doing this for so many years now and I, I'm still amazed that there are people today. In fact, I had one guy very recently who emphatically argued with me about the fact that he doesn't make money. And it's like, you can't just say you don't make money. You've got to ask yourself, why don't you make money? Mm. The money that you make is a byproduct of the market, the value that you are adding in the marketplace. The marketplace determines and places a monetary value on your skills. Mm. Now, you can't tell me that it's something that's out of your control. Well, what? where does money come from? Your income is determined by your level of mastery your understanding of solving a complex problem and your ability to promote yourself and what you do those all of those factors are in your control so how can we say i don't make enough money and just leave it at that well why don't we ask ourselves why don't i make money and really self-reflect and go and at least for the middle class okay forget about the people who are living in the poorest parts of africa because that's the argument that's going to come up you know like mm. you'll see all these middle class people from the Western world, and they'll start talking about poor people in Africa. And I go, hang on, forget about those people right now. I'm talking, about I'm talking to yeah. you about you. Why are you using that as an argument to support it's your It's more like, like an excuse. <laughs> it's an excuse. And they don't see it though, right? They're so disturbed mm -hmm. by the assertion that I make that your financial future is something that you determine. They're yeah. so disturbed because they don't want to take responsibility. No, they played a victim their whole life. They've right. certain circumstances. So now when somebody comes along and says, no, 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 you are the reason why you're, you are struggling financially. And I don't say that because I'm trying to antagonize them. I'm not blaming them, but I'm saying you're responsible. People mm -hmm. don't want to take responsibility. So uh, that's one of the biggest issues we have. And, and the other thing I have noticed, and I've been doing this for many, many years, every time I put content out on money and wealth, women don't respond much. Oh, really? Nope. Women don't respond. And for years now, we know women will respond to anything of a spiritual nature, mindset nature, anything you talk about people. The moment you talk about money, uh, crickets. Interesting. And very few women are, are very, and then, and, and we, women are complaining about the fact that there is financial disparity and financial inequality. Well, uh, why are they not stepping up and taking control? Because I think there was one report that I read that said that the 
four of the future are going to be single women in the Western world. Wow. Right? So they have to be more proactive. Women make wonderful investors. They have great temperament. They're able to manage their volatility, uh, their, their, their um, em emotional disposition. They tend to be uh, less, they don't have the overconfidence issue like a lot of young men have. So they make amazing investors, but they're just not interested. Ron, you have a daughter, right? I have a daughter, that's right. So I'm curious, how have you kind of integrated some of these things you were talking about with the education system, where it doesn't cover some of these things, especially around, you know, financial and wealth management. Now, obviously, I'm sure your kids have a little bit of advantage because dad's figured it out for, for a while. But at the same time, how are you instilling, like, say, your daughter to be interested in this process? Because let's say, you know, you're not, you're not going to be uh, there always to help her. But how are you, you know, training her at this point or teaching her, especially with school not doing that? And how can that yeah. translate to perhaps other younger kids who will be watching this who maybe feel scared because the school doesn't have a future and they've, they're starting to see that shakiness that the system that they were a part of is not really going to care about their longevity, yeah. you know, and their financial success. So how, you know, especially by putting them in death, right, debt right out of the way. Right. So what would you say, you know, like in terms of that and how you've kind of utilized that in your personal life with your kids? Well, I teach my daughter, I said to her, I said, look, this, some of what you need to learn, you're going to learn from school, but you're not going to learn everything from school. A right. lot of it, to teach you and we have a plan already when she turns 10 which is in another two years i will be taking her across the world and having her mentored by the best people on mindset on emotional intelligence on leadership money business uh, but i've said to her i said look you still need to know school because you need to know how to comply you don't want to be over compliant but you need to know how to follow rules you don't mm -hmm. want to be overly compliant and from the beginning, we have made her understand that school has a purpose, but the purpose is not to make you successful. It mm. is to teach you some life skills for survival. Mm. The success skills will be taught by me. Um, and then uh, we have, for example, you know, when her and I play, she typically plays a shopkeeper. And in fact, we recently did a whole thing where I, we were in actually bed together and this was just before she was going to bed and I was putting her to sleep. And I said, let's talk about if you were to start a business, what kind of business would you start? Wow. And she said, I would start a shop where I would sell clothes and toys. And I said, who would you sell it to? She said, everybody. I said, no, pick one category. <laughs> niche <Sell> down, <laughs> niche down. <laughs> and, then, and then I said, what would you call the business? And then she came up with a name called Zilla. I said, oh, Zilla, what does that mean? She said, I just like the name. So then I put up, grabbed my phone and we went into one of these apps where she could design her own logo. Mm. Wow. And, you know, like in the beginning, that's how you got to get them interested because they like that, that creative stuff so yeah. she was very yeah. interested she saw it, and then we came up with a tagline i said now the business is ready what are you going to do she said i'll wait for customers i said well okay so next morning she woke up and i said i made this massive announcement about the business and i said and today we welcome my daughter's name is sophia and i said today we welcome sophia majoy the new ceo of zilla who did all the work because Sophia Melhotra was too busy sleeping. So <laughs> Sophia Major from Singapore has now taken over the company. And she just looked at me, she was shocked. And she said, but it's my company. I said, well, you can't just start a company and go to sleep. You've actually got to work on it. Oh, wow. What a right? lesson. So <laughs> she was just shocked because she expected me to say her name, but I didn't. But we talk about money and I, you know, I like, we, I have this thing where on her birthday, she gets a lot of money from her grandparents and from other family members. And we have this thing. If you do not spend that money for 12 months, I will double it. Wow. If you don't spend it for two years, I will give you 200% of that. Right? So like she, yesterday, she was saying to me that she has this money that she's got sitting. She said, I haven't spent it for two years. Only yesterday, she told me that. Wow. So you got to triple her money now, right? So you taught so her basics of investments. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> And so we're already starting to get her to start to understand how money works. And then right from the time that she was a baby, you know, I, because I do a lot of stuff on the mind and I explain to her the subconscious mind, which is the bottom part of her mind. And I always say to her, look, that part of your mind is always this. You have to be careful what you say about yourself because mm. you might say, oh, I'm so dumb. I'm so stupid. And you know, you know, you don't mean it, but the bottom part of your mind doesn't know you don't mean it. So what happens is anything you say over and over again, or you think over and over again, becomes a part of your personality. So you have to be very careful what you say. And since she's been born, we have been giving her these affirmations, which we, you know, and I used to always whisper in her ears when she's sleeping. And I would say, Sophia's intelligent, Sophia's beautiful, Sophia's a leader, Sophia loves her mommy and daddy, and Sophia loves God. They're the things that we've always taught her. And That's beautiful. 
People say, well, why do you do it? She well, she doesn't even know the meaning. I said, no, she doesn't need to consciously know what it means. I'm planting it into the subconscious. Yes. And as we have now observed, as she's gotten older, she is demonstrating the qualities of being a, a, a leader. She is, takes a lot of pride in her appearance. So you see that the self image, you know, you have to build children up right from that age. Right. And I want her to think differently. And I've already said to her, uh, in the process of you learning all of this, and as you grow up, you're going to have people who are going to do the wrong thing by you. They're going to lie to you. And it's already starting to happen. Mm -hmm. So we have, I've prepared her to be mentally tough because I've tell, told her many times that, look, there's a lot of children today. They can't deal with problems. Right. They're happy as long as there's no problems. But I want you to actually be okay with problems because that's how you grow. Right. I love uh, it. And, yeah, and I'm concerned because these days, if you're in the Western world, you know, you don't, kids don't really have too many problems. Mm. So you have to somehow, as parents, create some problems for them <laughs> at home. So that, so that they're having some, they're, they're developing their skills and dealing with challenges. Yeah, that's really, that's a terrific story, by the way. You know, one thing you mentioned with helping your daughter to see the value of money by uh, promote or, you know, encouraging her to continue the journey of wanting to start a little business, right? I'm curious how you played like the whole branding piece into this, right? You, you mentioned she had to create a little logo. So she learned about how, how you form a business. You know, part of our studio services is really to help people share their voice and to hone in on, you know, what they're about and giving them a platform where they can create content in an easy way. And then also we started to think, well, you know, a lot of people now are putting themselves out there, right? So how do you distinguish yourself? Well, branding is, of course, a very important part of that. So I'd be curious to hear your take about it, because one thing we did is if you can see behind us, we have a backdrop. So we added it as a value added service to our business, uh, a, a podcast backdrops as a side uh, that we added to our business as a service. You know, we partnered up with another company, brought in another partner who's been doing printing for a long time. And so we've been able to help people get customized you know, logos, step and repeat patterns, like similar to you, how you would if you went on a talk show, perhaps, or if you started right. your own. The reason behind is because, as you can tell, probably attention spans are so short. But if somebody sees a little video of you, and even if they don't watch the whole thing and they get an idea about what you're about, you're starting to reinforce that branding. So it's kind of that subtle value that we felt was being added. So I'm curious, like how you've, and you, you, I have to compliment you. You have great branding. Yeah. That's, amazing. I've, I've seen you for a long time, by the way. I'm really, really thankful we get to talk today. Uh, I followed you for about at least five years, I think. And, uh, it's, it's, I know you're very good at your personal branding and for your business, of course. So how would you say, you know, what, what parts of it are, do you think are critical or what have you kind of learned as of now is like an important piece? Is that something that people should train up, uh, train up on? That's definitely not something you learn in school. Just like sales is not something you learn in school. You know, so I'm trying to think about what are these pillars that you would talk about and how, how each of them are important for your success, you know, in business and of course, which lead to your financial success. Well, we, we actually, it's funny you, you talk about this because I have a number of my mentees who are on LinkedIn and they're hugely successful. They have prominent brands and mm. we have a program called Magnify You, which we actually use for uh, people who want to position themselves as a thought leader. And one of those elements that we teach them is, of course, personal branding. Now, I haven't spoken to my daughter about this in great detail. I don't think she's ready for it yet. Uh, but I have encouraged her to start to have her own domain and um, we've, we've got her domain and but also um, setting up an Instagram account. I think she's a bit afraid of visibility. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we always say to people is, look, you need both expertise and visibility. There are four types of people, people who have no visibility and no expertise. These people are going to be the ones that are going to suffer the most in the new economy. Then you have people who have high expertise, low visibility. They're typically the professionals. Uh, they've done a lot of work on developing their skills, but they don't know how to position and promote themselves. Mm. Third category of people is what we call people who've got high visibility but low expertise. They're the the marketers, the slick marketers, are very very good at marketing and positioning themselves, but they don't really have a lot of soft skills. Right. Mm. So in the long term, they're going to suffer reputational damage because you can't get away now. If so, if you if people have an inferior experience with you, they're going to put a Google review or a Facebook review. Yeah. And so it's something you see that these people move from business model to business model to business model because they're burning a lot of people. Right. And then there's a fourth category of people which is the high expertise and high visibility. And that's where I recommend that everybody should be. You must, there is no substitute for expertise. You must be extremely proficient and have a reasonable level of mastery in your, your subject if you're going to stand out in any credible and sustainable way. Mm. Having said that, expertise without visibility is not sufficient. So you need to be strategically visible. And one of the tools, not that personal brand is everything, but one of the tools you use is a powerful personal brand. 
And of course, from my daughter's perspective, you know, she thinks the brand is just a logo, but we know that it's a lot more than that. Uh, it's the feel that people get when they interact with you. It's what they think of you, and it's your reputation. And we, we, last night, we had a, a, a bash that we ran with our, a group of our mentees where we were talking about personal brand. And I said to them, the personal brand, and I explained to them, number one, the, your personal brand is your personal essence. Who are you deep down, genuinely and authentically as a person, mm. even when you buy yourself? Okay, so not the public facade, but who are you really as a person? And that incorporates everything from your beliefs, your philosophies, what you stand for, what you stand against, but also having a fundamental understanding of if you were a car, what car would you be? If you were an animal, what animal would you be? If wow. you were strong, what strong would you be? We actually get them to do these various exercises to really start to get a feel. Like one of the questions we asked them was, if you were a celebrity, what celebrity would you be and why? Mm. And why we do that is because anyone that you really admire, let's just say there's a group of five people that you really admire, and you can identify the common characteristics of all those five people that you really admire. Well, what that's telling you is that that is in you as well. You just need to unlock it. That particular quality that you're admiring mm. in the five people that you admire the most is a quality that's inside of you. The only difference is they've unlocked theirs, you haven't unlocked yours. Mm. Right? Amazing, yeah. Then we talk to them about their personal voice. And the voice is not just your spoken voice, but your written voice. It's how you communicate. For example, I'm a very direct shooter. Everybody knows it. But the reason I'm that way is because it allows people to make an informed choice whether or not they want to come into my universe or they don't. Some people absolutely cannot stand me. Mm. Some people absolutely love me. But I'm not going to chop and change who I am to be widely accepted because for me, it's never been about likability. It's been about respect and being trusted. I don't believe in being likable. I not that I want to be disliked by people, but for me, likability is a currency that has less value than respect and trust. Yeah, because at one point you'll start appeasing people instead of actually trying to- Correct, correct. And it's not that I, I mean, I like being liked, don't get me wrong. I don't want to be the most disliked person on the planet, but I am changing who I am and my philosophy and what I believe right. for so you can like me a little bit more. That's basically the point. Yeah, absolutely so, amazing, yeah. Correct. That's your personal voice. And the third element of personal branding is what we call personal style. You know, the thing is that most people will make an impression about you within the first three to seven seconds, and they will make an impression about your ability to lead, your financial status, your credibility, and your attractiveness within three to seven seconds. So that's not enough time for you to be able to communicate your message or your philosophy or your character or your accomplishments. So the only visual tool that you have really is how you show up physically. Mm. So you've got to know who you are because I'm, my personal style statement is very aligned with who I am. It's not fake. I'm not the jeans and t-shirt type of guy. I'll never be that guy, right? And 80% of the time you will see me show up in a particular way. I'm more comfortable in a suit and tie. I actually feel naked without a tie, <laughs> to be honest with you, than somebody who might feel very like, I don't have a Gary uh, Vaynerchuk brand. Right. Very different brand. But you've got to know who you are. And then it's also got to have alignment with, you know, your values. It's got to have alignment with the industry that you represent. Uh, for the work that I do, you know, a suit is the right look for me. Now, I've had been I've been labeled old fashioned by many, many people. A lot of people say you're very old fashioned. And I go, thank you very much. Because I don't have a problem with that because yeah. I'm I'm more a little bit more conservative, I'm a bit more traditional. But I have a lot of high paying clients right. who value it. I have a lot of CEOs, I have uh, a lot of executives who don't like trendy people. Mm. Right? Yeah. Well, they say old is gold. My grandma used to say that all the time. Correct. But you've got to know who you are. And I think I've always had the spirit of an old man. I look at my top eight mentors. They were all older men. So, but the thing is, I've embraced it. Rather than trying to deny who I am, I've never been attracted to athletes or actors. I'm, never in, I'm not inspired by people like that. You know, and, and it's good to know who you really are, because once you know who you are, you can be all of who you are. Mm. And yeah. that becomes extremely powerful. And that's when you become memorable and you become compelling and you're not being fake. And it gives you the confidence to really stand for what you believe. And when you start to do that over a period of time, that's when people start to respect you. They may not like you, but they still respect you. Because yeah, because you, can... you show up consistently. Correct. And I think that has much more social value than somebody who's just constantly trying to appease people and constantly trying to seek consensus. My leadership style, I don't seek consensus. I'd rather 
spend 18 bloody hours a day becoming the best research person than mm -hmm. asking a bunch of people what they think when I clearly know that they don't know what to do because they're failing in their life. Mm -hmm. Now, some people may perceive that as arrogance, but I'm very convicted because if I am going to research, like a lot of people will say, well, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're the wrong room. I don't believe that. See, I don't subscribe to any such you know, messages one, that come out. Yeah, one through. thing that covers everything. <laughs> I just go to them and I go, does that apply to me? And I go, no, I want to be the smartest person, not from an ego perspective, but I, especially in my field, I am absolutely obsessed and dedicated to finding out everything that there is to know. And so it's going to happen that I'm going to walk into a room and sometimes I'm going to be the smartest person mm. in the room, but I don't need that as an ego boost. I need that because I need to know that I am working towards mastery and that allows me to create more value to people. Yeah. Absolutely so, amazing. Yeah. Well, yeah, go ahead if you have something. Yeah. To... So that's, I guess, from, I mean, everyone's got a personal brand. And I think these days, the wonderful thing is that your personal brand is the nucleus today. And when you build your ecosystem, you have multiple companies and brands that sit around you because the personal brand, your personal brand, your personal reputation is something that nobody can take away from you. If your company gets sued, it loses its brand and its goodwill. But if you get sued or your company gets sued, your personal brand is in gold. It's still mm. the name. Yeah, your reputation live with you. <laughs> Correct. See, somebody like Richard Branson, for example, can walk down Times Square tomorrow and say, you know, I want to start a lingerie company. And he'd have no problems in being able to attract publicity, funding, talent, because it's Richard Branson. Right. No one's going to say, hey, you have no experience in women's fashion. He'll say, well, bugger it. I don't really care. I'm <laughs> Richard Branson. Yeah. I can make it happen. So you have to understand the power of a personal brand and you can't fake it. Look, it's built over a period of time. I'm very consistent in showing up every damn day, seven days a week. I've been doing this for years now. And you've got to be that convicted about your message that you can't shut up about it. Mm. Right. Yeah. And especially when you know that it solves a very big and significant problem in the world that is being overlooked by everybody. And that gives you a lot of passion to stand up despite criticism, ostracization and being misunderstood. You keep showing up because you see that nobody else sees the problem yeah absolutely it's your problem. purpose your passion and your mission in a way that you were created to solve the way i see it you mentioned right earlier about like you, you definitely have seen both sides of the coin when it comes to your financial success and now when you're out promoting people to become financially independent or actually chase for that you know you, you mentioned earlier in this conversation you deal with a lot of negativity that people not everybody accepts this message right so I'm curious, like, how do you deal with that negativity in general as you're trying to push yourself through? You've been doing it for over a decade now, as you mentioned. So you know, uh, how is that? Your, is there like a formula that you've figured out for yourself at this point? And more importantly, for somebody that's also in that you know place where they're trying to figure out how, do, how am I going to be financially stable for the long period of time? Because generally for most people, thinking about the long term really gives them a lot of anxiety because right. we don't know the future. Nobody does. You can have a plan, but still you don't control exactly how things will go. So I'm curious, what's you know your mindset about that? Yeah, that's a common objection we get is, you know, Ron, is it guaranteed? And I go, no, but what you're doing has a 5% probability of success. What I'm telling you has a 90% probability of success. Which one are you going to choose? Right? Both are not guaranteed, but don't you want to maximize your probability? Right. So uh, you've got to first look at that because life is just about probabilities at the end of the day. It's about making a series of decisions that maximizes your odds of becoming successful. Mm. Okay, Not do anything because, well, you know, it's not a 50-50 bet. You actually have a 5% chance of financial success based on what you're doing right now. When I, when I talk about majority of people, that's where they're at. So why would you not want to increase your odds at least? Mm -hmm. right? You want to increase your odds. So, uh, you know, um, out of all the programs that I have, the one that deals with money has the least number of attendees. Hmm. And that's not, I'm not surprised by that because just people are just so like intimidated by the subject. But whose problem is that? Everybody's got to get comfortable. You're not going to get comfortable by avoiding it, right? You're only going to get comfortable by dealing with the reality. So the first thing is we have to understand that people are in four stages, unconscious incompetence, conscious incompetence, conscious competence, and unconscious competence. Okay, they're the four stages that people operate in. Unconscious incompetence is when you're incompetent, but you don't know you're incompetent. So you can't fix the problem because you don't know the problem exists. Mm. So the first thing we've got to do is we've got to make people realize that they're unconsciously incompetent so that they become consciously incompetent. And they go, oh, shit, I'm heading towards financial disaster. Yeah. I didn't even know it. Mm. Now, at that point, 
five to ten percent of people will actually make a decision to do something about their life 90 percent of them will just ignore it and completely be disturbed by the cognitive dissonance it will cause them so their way would be just to ignore the problem and avoid the problem and that's how unfortunately majority of human beings manage their lives and that's why a lot of them suffer and have perpetual struggle in their life the other thing is people need to understand that there's a thing called primary consequences and secondary consequences in most things i have observed through my understanding of universal and spiritual laws if the primary consequence is positive typically the secondary consequence ends up being negative so there are long-term consequences of every action that we take and one right. of the things that i have trained myself to do and i've been training my daughter to do is i always say to her when she has to eat her vegetables and i said look here is how it works if you have chicken nuggets every single day primary consequence a lot of pleasure secondary consequence down the track a lot of problems mm. Whereas if you have your vegetables, primary consequence, not so pleasant, but secondary consequence, very, very pleasant. You have beautiful skin, you have beautiful hair, you'll be able to manage your health, you'll have less illness, you'll see the doctor less, so on and so forth. And it's the way like that with everything in life. There was an interesting study done by Dr. Banfield of Harvard University. And he said the number one uh, predictor of economic mobility is long-term orientation. Majority of human beings, remember, have mastered survival which means they can always, they have a microscopic view of what's happening in their life right now, a week ahead, a month ahead. Yep. They don't have telescopic vision. Telescopic means you have to be able to look out in the long term and examine the impacts of your action in the long term. In society, in human society, those who have the telescopic vision end up doing financially a lot better than those who have microscopic vision. So you'll always see, if you see someone like a plastic surgeon who has a multi-million dollar practice, well, that person studied for 10 years, deferred gratification for a number of years, made a lot of good decisions to get to becoming a multimillionaire where they're now living in a $5 million, $10 million mansion, whilst the average person is barely, so many of them are struggling to pay rent. So the long-term orientation simply means to be the ability to be able to evaluate the consequence of your actions in 10 to 15 years from now, not now, but in 10 to 15 mm. years from now. Probably people don't do that. They're not trained to think that way. And majority of people are unfortunately also not trained to optimize their time and their efforts. So they waste a lot of time. They don't actually say, well, I'm going to do this today. What is the return on investment on my time? So they spend a lot of time in gossiping. They spend a lot of time watching entertainers, so on and so forth. There's no return on that time. So when you become financially astute, you want a return on investment on your time, your effort, and your energy. You, do, you become very conscious about the spillage or wastage of energy right. effort okay because time is your most important resource and occasionally i'll say to people if you are going to live to your life expectancy of 80 you only have four thousand weekends that's your entire life mm, yeah. if, you're, if you're 40 two thousand is already gone wow and in, two th in another thousand weekends you're going to be 60 so when are you going to do it when yeah. are you going to become wiser that's how quick life goes it's a sobering fact but one that must be confronted and you see a lot of people, they just defer and they defer and they defer. And you say, well, what are you waiting for? Exactly. Because that every single year that you are not investing and you're not in the markets, you, it's going to take you another two years to catch up. And it's going to take you double the amount to catch up. Yeah. Well, how are you going to do that? If you can't even do it now, how are you going to do it then? Absolutely. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have to understand how things work. And, you know, Market's actually not that unpredictable. If you had put a, if you had your grandparents, my grandparents had put a hundred bucks in the S and P five hundred and ninety, yeah, and left it there, despite all the economic crashes, the terrorist attacks, the natural disasters, all the wars we've had, that hundred bucks is today worth two hundred fifty thousand. Right. Yeah. That's all they had. To do. But here's the problem: they didn't do it. Our parents didn't do it, and chances are we're not going to do it either if we're not financially educated. And right. then our kids are not going to do it. And then we'll say, it's hard to make money. No, it's not. Nobody got started. Nobody got started on the wealth creation journey. So how do we expect money to fall into our lap? Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? And so that's the mentality that we have to, the, 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 my biggest battle is with the employee slash middle class mindset. It's not with a person. It's not with a, it's with that behavior, which is very entitled and expects mm -hmm. that financial success is a consequence of you doing a degree or it's not, or yeah. you getting a job. It's not. You have to think, if you're if all you know is how to do your job and you don't have financial skills and business skills you have locked yourself into being a laborer for the rest of your life 
even when I started this um, series uh, talking about money, it was really taboo. And they were curious, but they were walking on shelves trying to ask me questions. So like if I would post something on social media, they would actually go and send me direct message and ask something. They would not send something on, you know, in the comment section. This project, it's really as a challenge for myself to break that taboo. It's like you can do better. Like if you've gotten yourself to be nine to five in a middle class, that's mean you can still do more and there's still more time for you to do it I commend you and really respect you for continually doing that because i see it, it that is, it, is hard. it is hard definitely and and um there is a lot of hypocrisy in this though by the way just so mm -hmm. you know and i point, i call it out when i see it yeah and people like it but there is a lot of hypocrisy people always seem to have the money to be able to buy certain things and you'll, you'll be it's interesting even when i was dealing with a lot of business people what i realized was no matter what their income, they always had money to pay electricity, gas, food, car, house. They never had money to invest. Yeah. And I started looking to it and I realized it's because their mind is trained for survival. So if they get a bill, they'll pay it. But if it's a discretionary future expense, they won't. So we started to with some of our clients. We actually send them a bill every month for an investment amount. Oh, <laughs> so and you the change the mindset. It's like a bill. You have to pay it. <laughs> exactly. Can you imagine how badly we are trained? We will find, no matter what, every person in the middle class will find money right. to pay for food, electricity, gas. They never have money to invest. Yep. No matter what their income. Even if the income has gone up six or seven times in the last 10 years or 20 years. Can you, can you invest now? No, still don't have money. Well, you know what? We need to send you a bill. Then you'll start actually making positions. Yeah, and then you're like, okay, well, I'll pay that bill. And why is that okay? <laughs> Because that's how they're trained. And they, when people don't see that, you see, that's why you've got to form the right financial habits in the beginning. Because once the habits are set for survival, those habits are in many cases in complete contradiction to the habits that result in success and significance. Right. So then you've got, you are standing in your own way and not even seeing it. And the whole time you're blaming politicians and the economy and your bosses or your parents, but never really fully understanding that behind your financial situation is a series of decisions that you made. Yeah, absolutely. Incredible. So to get, get people to realize that is not an easy thing, of course. And uh, sometimes we have, and, and I'm not one to back up back from an argument. You know, people say you don't, you don't argue. And I go, no, no, I love it. I actually enjoy these arguments. <laughs> <laughs> You're passionate about it. I don't it. mind having these arguments. That's awesome. Yeah, it has been an, an incredible conversation. Yeah, I have to we say, learned, we've learned a so lot much, and, and we really appreciate your time. And really, in speaking, you know, about investment, um, I would kind of really want to lead into that you coach people to become wealthy, and you talk about this hard subject. And I'm just gonna say it the way it is: is for some reason, it's okay to get in debt to have student loan for like, you know, I don't know. Some people have it for five years, ten years, thirty years but it's not okay to invest in the mentor. It's like, I'm saying it's a you know, stigma that, oh, well, that mentor costs this much money. Well, why don't you think it's your school education? You can put your funding for college in there too. Why is that not okay? And yeah, yeah I'll, be, I'll continue to be in this space simply because there is such a big gap. And you're right, I mean, people are conditioned, because they're conditioned to survive, they will always prioritize anything that puts them into survival. So a degree will put them into survival, mentorship can put them into success they will not prioritize that that will be seen as a negative expense this will be seen as a positive expense because the mind is trained for survival only you have to understand this it is so this is super fascinating to actually see and the the, the problem with the education system is it's not developing self-awareness mm, when you don't have self-awareness you can't see the thought beneath the thought beneath the thought Right. So you just act, you become the thought rather than observing the thought. Right. Rather than wow. observing the values and, and beliefs. Now you can never change this type of conditioning by having a logical conversation. Hmm. Okay? A logical conversation will never, ever, ever change a person's belief system because they believe their belief system to be completely rational and they will defend it to the nth degree even if it's failing them. Mm. And we see this all the time. Right. right? cognitive the feeling of cognitive dissonance and that's why one of the things you'll find is if you actually study millionaires and billionaires they're very good at being able to hold two opposing ideas in their mind for long periods of time without rushing to closure whereas the average person needs closure immediately because they cannot stand the conflict in their mind so as a consequence what they'll do is they'll end up defending the very thing that's failing them they will not be open to looking at an alternative and so 
all we can do really is I have to be very proactive in the marketplace and continually to open up the conversation and hope that five to 10% of people, and I have no hope that more than five or 10% of people will ever do it because statistics have shown that more, more 90% of people will not take action, even when given the right pathway and given the right information. Yeah. So those five or 10% will start to grow, of course, and it's, it's, it's growing at a compounding rate for us. We have thousands of people overall that are coming into our programs. Now, what is next for you and what is community can expect from you and where they can learn more? And the Future Millionaires Academy, we have a model called the SISPIP model, S-I-S-P-I-P, which is a word that I coined. And how it works is first step in the wealth creation sequence is the S, skills. And I'm talking about skills that create a high income that you can influence. Mm. So if you don't fix that, nothing else, you can't create wealth. Second is you need to then make enough income. The I insisted is income and income that covers your basic expenses, your lifestyle expenses, but gives you another 20% to invest right. or save. Third, the S in the SISPIC model is savings. You must have at least six to 12 months worth of your income in savings before you invest. Right. P, protection. Then you've got to be able to afford all types of insurances that you need because anything that can go wrong at some point, you must mitigate through some sort of risk mitigation, risk transfer, insurance policies, which will cost you money. Yeah. If I invest in, now you invest. Okay. And then we talk about what you should, what other types of various investment vehicles are there and what are typically appropriate for you, depending on your goals and all of that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then you go into P, which is preservation. Whatever wealth you're building, you want to put a bulletproof structure around it so that if you get sued, if you have a relationship split up, uh, if your business goes under, uh, if you get ill, injured, nothing goes wrong, you still get to keep your wealth. Because mm. a lot of people will actually end up making wealth, but then they lose it because they right. don't think they can preserve it. Right, absolutely. Yeah. We've heard so there's those a bit stories. Of science behind it. Yeah. There's a bit of science behind it. Nobody teaches it. People will just go, go and invest here. Well, you're telling a 25 year old kid who doesn't know has income right now he probably needs to invest in his skills at this stage you're telling him to go and invest in the stock market i bet you within three to five years he's going to make that money back and three to five years is not enough a long time frame for him to create wealth in the stock market mm, yeah so people are not thinking this through there's a lot of incomplete information out there and we have in the program we cover everything from the psychology of wealth habits of wealth to the wealth creation sequence and then go into every single sequence and dissect it and step by step. We also teach you how to identify your financial independence number, how to identify where you are, what the gap is, and then what kind of strategies to use to cover that gap. Yeah. And the reason I did that is because as a wealth advisor, you know, we, we are paid between five to fifteen thousand dollars for working with each client. Now, majority of people can't afford that. Mm and they're not even ready at the point where the wealth advisor will want to see them simply because they have no investable assets right so then i thought well there's a whole market out there where people have the ambition and drive but don't have the money and the tools how can we create something for them and that's how the future millionaires academy was born and the tagline is become the first millionaire in your family because that's who i was mm. so i thought you know that's a good tagline and i know a lot of people have started to use it now this is in it plastered all all over social media and I'm <laughs> you innovate and everybody will copy it's a good thing it's a good thing yeah but 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 now everyone's like claiming that they can do oh. that but we have any tools for it right yeah so we created the entire program it's a very very comprehensive program and you are there is accountability in it and there is we set targets and there is no getting away like you've got to do the work and when people realize there's actually work involved in this yeah, yeah. you can't just become financially savvy by reading one or two books that's impossible that's what people think you become financially savvy, but you don't. So, you know, we've tried to create a very, very comprehensive program. And, uh, you know, we also cover a lot of the mindset stuff. And there's a lot of stuff as it pertains to wealth and financial habits that can cause uh, financial ruin and all of that sort of stuff. So they have a full 360 degree perspective on wealth creation. Amazing. So this program is available for everybody or is that very everybody except except australian residents because i still have a license in australia so unfortunately i can't offer it to australians at this point uh but i can offer it to other people it's an educational program yeah um, i still advise people you need to at some point go and see a certified financial planner yeah some trusted advisor at some point but you need to at least if you can't just go to an advisor and not know what you're doing you still need to control the relationship 
and you need to know what they're doing and you need to be able to ask them good questions because in the world of finance if you ask the wrong questions you'll get the wrong answers mm. so the first thing is you got to know the right questions and that's what the program does is it makes you more financially savvy so when you're in front of a financial advisor you can tell if they're driven by their own self-interest you can tell if they're following the principles and fundamentals you can ask them about their philosophy and you can then connect and see how that's going to impact your financial position otherwise and i say this in business as well never delegate something just because it's too hard and you don't understand it yeah right? i agree delegate it after achieving some competency so you can monitor and manage and you can control it because otherwise how do you know they're doing the right thing or not yeah it's Absolutely. a le leadership skills too um, to take responsibility of your knowledge. Well, thank yeah. you so much for this time. And, I, you know, I really appreciate this time that we have together and um, really learn a lot. And I hope that, you know, our audience will learn a lot. Um, one practical thing before we part our ways is what can you recommend people that are, you know, in, I would say, mentally crisis right now in pandemic, right? Uh, what is the thing that we'll, you would recommend them to do to really position themselves to actually come out on another side after, you know, all this COVID happened? Like what should they be spending their time on while being at home? So then actually yeah. being better off after all this happened. I'll give some two simple tactics. I usually don't like to prescribe tactics without an understanding of principles, but I will give you two, a couple of tactics just so that they have some takeaways. Number one, write down every belief that you have about money. Money is the root cause of all evil. Money doesn't grow on trees. Mm -hmm. All your limit, And ask yourself how many of those beliefs are limited. And then on the same piece of paper, write the polar opposite of that belief. Okay, what is the polar opposite? That's the first thing, because most people already have negative beliefs around money, so they're not going to prioritize the mind. Right. Where there is a clash between desire and belief, the belief will always trump the desire. So if you desire to become wealthy, but your belief is that wealth is difficult or it's about arrogance or exploitation, wherever there's a clash between desire and belief, the belief will always win. Yeah. So the first thing you've got to do is bring the belief in line with your desire. Mm. And that's why you've got to first look for examples of wealthy people that are doing amazing things, good things in the world. And you've got to proactively look for examples like that. And you've got to create really positive associations with wealth creation, not with money making money, with wealth creation, mm -hmm. very specifically. Second thing you need to do is you need to understand that majority of wealth creation problems exist because the person doesn't have the skills that the market values. So you need to build two type, one of two types of skills. Either you need to specialize in a particular area for which you might need to do a lot of formal education. And then after that, you may need to do a lot of work experience. Or the second one is you can go for some generic skills that are highly paid and transferable across different industries, sales, marketing, negotiation, uh, project management, um, uh, advisory, mentoring. These are skills which do not require high capital. They do, they do require uh, you to use your mind. And once you know how to become extremely proficient at diagnosing people's problems and solving them, mm. you can literally command very high fees, even if you do it as a side gig, it doesn't have to be a full business, but I call it the third path. Uh, traditional career path is traditional employment. Yeah. And then you have traditional employment. The third career path is where you take your passion and you package it in such a way that solves a real world problem. And because it's a complex problem and you develop an intellectual property process where you can solve the problem and only you can solve it the way you can solve it. Then what that allows you to do is to command premium prices for your services. Mm. Okay. So our clients, for example, some of our mentees charge ten, fifteen thousand dollars. They were struggling. Some of them were charged, struggling to charge three hundred dollars. The reason is it all comes down to how you package and promote, but also your understanding of the problem and your ability to articulate the problem in a way that your prospective buyers understand. Yeah. So I know that it, I know that it's a lot, but at this point, they're the only two things: get rid of all the negative belief systems and identify a skills that you can work on. And here's the thing: you don't need ten thousand hours to develop a skill. You can develop any skill within six months. So for example, let's just say, as an example, I'm not recommending this for people to fix their income problem, but let's just say you wanted to become an author. And you said, okay, becoming an author is a skill set. What are the sub skills that make up that skill? I need to know how to write a book. I need to know how to proofread a book. I need to know how to edit a book. I need to know how to design a book. I need to know how to publish a book. I need to know how to market a book. Six sub skills that make up that big skill. skill. Then what you do is for the next 30 days, you spend an hour each day just developing that one sub skill. Yeah. Okay. You spend focused effort on 
speaking to somebody or reading blogs or reading academic papers on just that one skill for the next 30 days. So in 30 days now you have proficiency in one sub skill. Next 30 days you have proficiency in the sub sub. And the next six months you've actually acquired the entire skill set enough for you to view to be able to do something, but potentially for you to even mentor, advise people or train people yeah. on it. Yeah. So it's not really that hard. The problem is people can't focus. Mm. And so, uh, you know, that's why a good book is Cal Newport's book, Deep Work. The ability to do deep work has been lost. The ability to sit in one place for long periods of time and not get up and not check your phone. These things are also destroying people's capabilities, unfortunately. So again, it comes down to mental disciplines. Yeah, well, I love what you have to share. And what I have taken away is really having a good mentor, um, like you or either people, you know, figure out that they need some other different skill than money or, you know, like leadership skill or becoming millionaire. You need to have a mentor. Like, I don't believe in people that say, well, I'm self-made. Like, yeah, you're self-made, but on the journey to your success, you had people that walk with you, right? So amazing I, conversation. I continue, mentor, I continue to mentor you today. 12 yeah. years in mentoring, I've still got a mentor. Our, new, our recent mentor is a lady who is now turning 70, sold a $30 million business. Because we know that the more we learn, the more we realize how little we know. And so for us to go to get to the next level and the next level, we must stand on the shoulders of other giants. Yeah. Yeah. But it amazes me that people spend no money and time on mentorship. Yeah, it's continued learning. I mean, how do you expect to grow otherwise? There is a lot that you can find out online. But like, as you said, with a short attention span, not most people will even sit there to find a yeah. solution or look at, read articles enough or even, you know, get the right type of courses yeah. if they needed to. So, yeah. Well, the other issue is online information is coming to you randomly. There's no structure. There's no context. That's true. But again, you can't absorb it and apply it because we get bits and pieces while I'm investing, do this for investing, do this for real estate no money down. Problem is, how do you know what to do and, and what sequence? Yeah. So the content is missing with the content and that creates a big problem as well. Yeah, and I love what you share and everything that you have touched on. It's exactly how I feel that our generation, like late 20th, are feeling right now. It's overwhelming. You do need to figure out for your family and for your future, but then there's overwhelming, you know, like situation of like information and then life happened and then COVID happened, right? So I would just encourage everybody go check out um, Rant Maholtra's um, videos on YouTube if you want to get to know more about him, um, you know, con connect with him on LinkedIn, ask questions and sign up for the program that he has out there because it is for people who are trying to become the first millionaire. That's the way to go, I would say, <laughs> from what, what I learned from this conversation. Appreciate the endorsement. And thank you very much. Yes. It's nice to meet you both and uh, uh, good work that you're doing. And I hope that, that uh, you achieve your objectives. And, you know, if you want to have a chat, just give me a buzz.